Welcome, friends! This is episode 17 of my Enigmatica 2 Expert Extended playthrough series, and today we will continue what we have started in the last episode, and that is looking into computers chapter. Specifically, we will look into printers this time, we will examine some of the cool things they can do for us, but we will also learn a couple useful things about open computers mod in the process, and progress through several other branches of the questbook a bit. And as always, I would like to mention that I have upgraded the pack from version 1.26 .0, and this episode we will be playing on the version 1.45.0. I really like the fact that the pack is live and keeps changing, and there are many interesting additions by modpack author Krutoy242, as well as other contributors, and you can read all about these changes in great detail on the pack's GitHub page. Then let's get right into it. And the big topic of today is 3D printers, because these devices can 3D print actually useful things for us. And as the description of the quest says, in order to use the 3D printer, we will need to feed it with chameleon and any dye. The recipe for chameleon requires dust, which is easy to get, pile of ashes, which we can get as well, but it also requires a latex from industrial far going. And these are great news for us, because if we look at our progress board, our current milestone, which is a Mi controller, the sub goal for this milestone is actually starting industrial far going chapter, while the computers for us were simply a side task. We have finished the industrial Fargoing gate back in episode 12, and this is where we got a tree fluid extractor, the machine that produces latex we need. But we got just one machine. And if we look at the industrial Fargoing chapter itself, we'll learn that we will use the latex inside the latex processing unit to create rubber, which we will use for many other machines in the chapter. And so it makes total sense to start mass producing latex right away, and then the question arises. Where in the base should we place that production? Long time ago, when I first settled in my new base in the valley, I used to rely on rats to haul the wood for us and drive our automated wood production. These days, as you know, I'm mostly using forestry farms to produce wood, so maybe it's the time to clean out this place and make it our main industrial foregoing production area. But it would be a great shame to let all these leaves go to waste. Luckily, not only we don't have to, but we can actually kill two birds with one stone here, because the pile of ashes, which is required for chameleon production alongside with latex, can be made from ash block, and the ash blocks can be produced using the portal spread technique from leaves. If you are unfamiliar with the nether portal spread, back in the version 1.21.0, Krutoy242 took the mode by the same name, nether portal spread, and coded its features into the pack using craft weaker scripts. Since then, he has actively worked on this feature and used the level of control now available to him to add a couple nice and fun tweaks to the spreading mechanic. Let me briefly highlight the current version of it. If we light the portal, the message in the bottom left corner will tell us that the corrupted energy from from the portal is slowly spreading around it, and what this means is that the typical overworld blocks like sand, dirt or stone over time will get converted into their nether variants, slowly creating a little island of nether in the overworld. If we close the portal, the message will say that the spread has stopped and the blocks are safe to place again. If we right click the portal with an empty hand, the message will appear and tell us what are the portal parameters. These values tell us how fast the corruption spreads and how many blocks get checked every time it happens, but if you are not concerned with the timing, the third and likely most important parameter is the reach of the portal spread, which, as you can see, is 16 blocks for an unmodified portal. The best way, in my opinion, to visualize the portal spread and the great feature added by the author is grabbing yourself a flint and steel and looking at the portal. You will see a field of purple particles slowly growing around the portal, telling you exactly how far the corruption field can reach. It looks much better in game than on video, and I want to commend Krutoy on his awesome coding and artistic skills for this edition. To modify the parameters of a given portal, we have two options. First one is conglomerate of coal, and this is the boosting option, and the second one is simply a block of coal, and that one is a 
culling option. Conglomerate of coal has pretty complex recipe, however we figured out how to mass produce it back in episode 14, while obviously the block of coal has very simple recipe. To modify the portal, you have to place conglomerate of coal or the block of coal at the portal corners where I currently placed the blocks of redstone. If we place the block of coal in the corner, the radius of the spread will decrease along with the conversion rate, while conglomerate of coal will increase both of these things. What this means for you in practice is that you can increase or decrease the radius of the portal spread from 0 to 64 blocks, as well as modify the conversion rate by using block modifiers. If we look in the JEI, Nether portal spread actually has 6 pages of recipes, and some of them are quite interesting and maybe we'll use them later, but for now let's concentrate on the leaves. If we look at the map, we will see that our leaf patch pretty much fits within the 2 chunk radius, therefore a portal spread with radius radius of 16 will do for us. I have picked my rats and cleaned up most of the snow over there, I think it is time for us to light the fire. When the portal is lit, the conversion is slowly starting. As you can see without any modifiers, the conversion rate is quite slow, and even though we are not in a rush, Let's see what happens if we speed this up. Adding just two conglomerates of coal boosts up the speed significantly, we just need to stop the process in time until it reached the ground. To do that, all we need to do is remove the conglomerates of coal. Hey, little pigman. Looking at the particle field, we can easily tell that the conversion has stopped and the portal converted everything it can, so let's harvest the ash and the charcoal logs. This little exercise netted us 71 stacks of piles of ashes and 8 stacks of charcoal from charcoal logs. Pretty nice, right? Since we are going to clean up the space for the industrial foregoing, I think it's time to remove this thing. We have built it in episode 7, and it was very nice at the time, very cheap redstone controlled automated lava generation but we can do better with the technology now available to us. This is much more compact design, based on the controller from Xnet of course, with most of connections neatly hidden underground, and redstone control channel ensures that the void slot will start filling with cobblestone only if we drain the container a little bit, and then after 5 seconds the void slot will start filling. Now that we have a nice clean area, let's figure out the latex production. The tree fluid extractor is kinda cheap, except it needs the iron gears, so let's fire up our press. Now that we have a couple tree fluid extractors built, we can make this contraption. It consists of 16 building blocks like this, which is 4 tree fluid extractors around the ME formation plane. The ME portion of the bottom consists of 5 channels, one being the import bus, and then 4 channels supplying the wood to the tree fluid extractors, and we get that from a steel storage box. The system is symmetrical in the top part, and the top part contains this energy acceptor to power the ME portion of my setup, and of course the top and the bottom has to be connected through the quartz fiber to transfer the energy and separate both portions because of course we're using 5 channels out of 8 both in top and the bottom. And of course the controller controls the whole thing, moving the wood into the tree extracting area and then extracting latex into this drum. Perhaps for what we are doing right now this setup is a little bit of an overkill because we are producing latex with a rate of about 0.2 buckets per second, however we indeed might need this much in the future, so let's keep that setup running. Last thing we need for chameleon is dust. We could automate it of course, just like we're doing with sand, but instead at this point I believe it's better to just grab 18 of double compressed sand, go somewhere nice, place them down and then use a sledgehammer with smashing tool and excavate modifiers. We now have about 21 stacks of dust, which for now is just fine. Since we are growing dye plants in the large quantities, it's definitely a time for us to start working on a printer. First we craft the printer of course, and it is pretty cheap. We can then assemble our computer, and just for fun here, let's go with the cheapest components available in tier 1 computer case. We'll attach a tier 1 screen to it, put the printer down, put the keyboard, and then power it with the spectra coil. We will also need a couple stacks of dye, and we'll grab some latex to create 4 stacks of chameleon. You can fill the printer by opening it and loading chameleon and the dye into it, and the printer should be ready to go. For the next step we will need an OPPM package manager, which can be made from interweb that is made inside the kiln, and the floppy disk. 
We can now follow the steps, which are outlined in the 3D printer quest. However, there is a twist. We cannot really install a PPM manager on this particular computer, because this tier 1 case doesn't have the slots that are needed for some of the components required for a PPM manager installation. So what we will do here is grab the tier 1 graphics card, as well as the empty hard disk drive from this computer, craft the internet card, which is tier 2 component, and get to our nicer, higher tier computer with disk drive already connected to it. The idea here is simple. O PPM package manager requires an internet card, which can only be inserted in the tier 2 slot. Now that the tier 2 slot is taking, we have to use the tier 1 graphics card in order to use the monitor on this computer. Finally, we can take out an existing hard drive and insert an empty one, where we will install the operating system as well as the package manager itself. This whole procedure really reminds me of my youth, where I had to install some games on a computer but lacked the disk drive to do so. Now now we can start the computer, install the operating system, and once this is done, follow the steps in 3D printer chapter, which are put the OPPM package manager into the disk drive, run install OPPM command, and then hit yes, and once the package is installed, type OPPM install print 3D program, and OPPM install print 3D examples. When everything has finished, it is time for us to put everything back. Let's put our graphics card and a hard disk drive in a tier 1 computer and see if it starts. This looks like a success. We can now 3D print the companion cube using the step 4 of the 3D printer quest guide and typing print 3D user share models cc.3dm. As you can see, the job was successful and we take the companion cube out. I can reach quite a bit higher with this companion cube for these quick base ceiling repairs, but perhaps we could figure out some better uses for our 3D printer. And right away we can do this by choosing our 3D printer quest reward. And I will go for the 3D printed tier 3 storage module schematic. The steps we need to follow next are described in the printing ingredients quest. And what we need to do is to go into our computer, remove the BIOS from it, and insert our T3 storage module schematic. Then we need to type a command flash dash qr and then the name of the file we need to copy from the flash. In my case, it's storage module 3.3dm. If we check the contents of our home directory now with ls command, we can see it now contains the required file. Let's try printing it now by typing print3d and then the file name. The job was successfully committed and we can take a look at the item printed, which is tier 3 storage module model. If we paste this item into the crafting grid, we will get our tier 3 storage module. And of course, we know that tier 3 storage modules are great because we found some earlier uh, in our playthrough in dungeon chests and they can contain 300 stacks of items, while most of our modular storage units actually contain only tier 1 storage module which store up to 100 stacks. So right now we can upgrade all of them to the tier 3. Now that this is done, let's grab our reward, which in this case is pretty good diamond toolkit, which we can put it to a good use. And take a look at the next quest, which is called 3D Print Exchange. And it's an optional quest which allows to replace our EEPROM we just got with our tier 3 storage module 3D print model with any other models in the list. And because we already copied the model out of it, we have no problem doing exchange. And in fact, you can submit any old EEPROM in your inventory to fulfill this quest, now we can get a reward, and in this case, I will take a double layer capacitor. So at this point, we can repeat the same steps, meaning copy the double layer capacitor model from the flash, and then print it. I have repeated this optional quest four more times, and then every time I have copied the item into our computer, so now we have all of the models, and we could print all of these useful items in large quantities, however, 
There are a couple small issues. You have to type the command and file name fully, and you cannot ask to print multiple items and have to wait for one item to finish printing before asking for a new one. Luckily for us, we are playing with Open Computers mod, which rewards hard work and has all the tools to make all the processes as efficient as possible. In the previous episode, I went deep into my train of thought about how I'm making Open Computer programs, so here I don't want to talk too much about it, but I have added a two additional components, the transposer, which I again explained in the last episode, and the storage box to my computer, and I have made a custom printing program. Just like in the last episode, my coding was heavily influenced by large language models, and since then these models improved significantly, so I strongly believe everyone has the power of coding in open computers now. The only thing I really hope for is that AGI doesn't come out before my next episode. Episode. So what we have to do now is to go into our computer and type custom print, hit enter, and then the program will ask us which model we would like to print. For example, I will say index 2, which is double layer capacitor. When I hit enter, it will ask me how many of double layer capacitors I would like to print. Let's say I want 24. As you can see, the printing begins. We can look into the printer and see that the item gets printed and then it disappears, and it disappears into our steel storage box. For this script to work, it doesn't matter what type of the container you have for the output or where the container is located, what's important is that the transposer needs to be connected to the computer and have two inventories on its side, one being the printer and another being the output inventory. One thing I would like to mention explicitly here is that you remember in the beginning I went cheap and put just one memory stick into this computer, and this program requires more memory than that, so don't forget to place a second memory stick in. Since I am trying to skip some of the explanations here, I have created this GitHub page, which constantly expands as I am making this episode. I will make it public when I post my video, and if you want to use my custom printing script for example, you can see the detailed instructions there. I was hoping this approach will be more time efficient and practical for you. Please let me know what you think about that in the comments below. But in the meantime, we do have 24 3D printed capacitors, and this is quite a lot. I don't want all of them to go to waste, so what can we do with them? Couple episodes ago we have generated the sifting system, which makes among other things huge amount of apatite. We can combine the apatite together into a block, but in order to do something about this block, we need to progress in the actually additions chapter toward the crusher, so first let's make some inori crystals. Once we get the crystals, we can go back and claim our reward, which is a common loot crate, and then take a look at the crusher. This quest only needs us to make a crusher, and from the description you can see that the one benefit of the crusher is that you can get some silver from lead ore. A little interlude. After recording the last bit I went away from my computer while standing right here, and the monsters got me, but I have died of drowning way over there in the lake. And moreover, you can see that my death is far below the ground. And this is because under the peaceful surface of this lake, there is a nasty looking chasm, and apparently the currents pushed me and I died of drowning down there in the dark. Right, let's take a deep breath and go get our stuff and hope that the fish down there don't bite. Minecraft is an amazing game, unpredictable things happen all the time, and there are like hidden pockets of unknown even around my own base. Alright, where were we? The Crusher quest. Crusher itself is rather simple, but of course for basic coil uh, we need to craft some impregnated sticks and aluminum wire. Since we will probably need a lot of these basic coils, it makes sense to make a lot of oil for the stick impregnation, and I can actually choose between hemp seeds and regular seeds, which we have a lot of and we are dumping them at the moment, so it just makes sense to convert them into oil. For the actual carpenter setup, I want to use something a bit different here, and utilize the printing script I just made. Let's ask the printer to print the device frame, which is index number 3, and let's print 32 of these. The device frame 
can be used to craft many interesting things. In fact, we actually used it before to craft Igneous Extruder, but right now I want to concentrate your attention on Item Allocator and Fluid Allocator. Both of these things have pretty simple recipe and let's craft three Fluid Allocators and three Item Allocators. If we put the Item Allocator down and look inside, the Information tab actually explains that this machine can store and transfer items and it can automatically extract items and it says that it is better than a hopper. To examine this statement, I have put this simple setup together where we get hemp seeds into two squeezers using various item transfer methods. I wasn't really exhaustive in terms of the methods, but I have tried regular hopper, the pool hop from bit hop, the uh, transfer node from extra utilities, and finally the item allocator which is crafted. If we profile with lag goggles for 30 seconds, we will see the following results where you can see that the regular hopper can sometimes introduce lag into your world. Um, and the bit hop was actually fastest in terms of item transfer, followed by transfer node from uh, extra utilities at 10 microseconds per tick. And then item allocator shows 18 microseconds per tick. And so this is why I really love this pack. There are so many options which differ in so many ways. And in this case, for example, the item allocator is interesting compared to the transfer node or the pool hop, because as you can see, it can transfer uh, 64 items or a single stack at the same time. And then you can configure on this right panel the sides. So yes, it is slightly more laggy than the transfer node and the pool hop, but it has slightly more functionality as well. And yeah, I don't really like the regular hoppers because of the lag they can sometimes introduce when they are full of items. And so for impregnating our sticks with seed oil, we can have this simple setup with two squeezers providing oil for the carpenter. And sticks are made here are very slow, but at the same time, this setup will keep producing sticks while I'm doing other things. So I'm not really concerned about the speed. At this point, I have enough resources to make 32 basic coils. And now we can make a couple crushers. Crusher has a very simple setup. You put the item up top and you get results from the bottom. But you can also, if you use these advanced coils with pretty simple recipe, combine the two crushers into a double crusher. This little guy can process two stacks of item at the same time. And there is also an ability to auto split items if you like. I also think it's a good idea to add this double crusher to my processing arrays. However, I would like to split it from the mechanism line. So I'll put it here somewhere and attach it. Great, this looks like a beginning of a new processing line, probably a mixed mod one. But now let's fill our double crusher with the blocks of Apatit we crafted earlier. Looking at our output container now, and right now I can notice it has tier one storage module. We probably need to replace that. We can see that in this container, there appears a phosphor ore and some phosphor nuggets. According to the following recipe, we get about 5% chance of a phosphor nugget. I will explain you why do I want phosphor in a moment. But for now, as I was explaining you this recipe and the efficiency of the phosphor nugget extraction, I noticed that there is another tab for thermal centrifuge. And looks like this process is more efficient in terms of getting phosphor nuggets out of it. However, at this point, I'm not super concerned with efficiency since I have infinite appetite essentially. So we'll build the thermal centrifuge a little bit later. But right now we have a couple stacks of phosphor ore to be processed. And one of the best and easy ways for us to do it right now is to use crusher from extra utilities because we get 50% chance of getting a second phosphor nugget. And the good news is that we already have a crusher from one of the earlier episodes and the recipe for us is quite straightforward if we want to build any more. So now both of our crushers live together and I have powered them both. So now all I need to do is to go back to my output chest. And because the phosphor ore is very unique in that processing, I created a straightforward rule so that when I put it in um, our input crate, then the uh, processed phosphor nugget will appear in the output container. Since I do record this series, the time I spend on it is quite substantial. So if we take a look at our time in the bottle, it has 203 hours in it. So when I am impatient and I see items crafting quite slowly, I'm always tempted to just speed things up. 
This exercise netted us 3 stacks of phosphor nuggets and this transforms into 21 pieces of phosphor. And the reason I wanted to get our hands on the phosphor was to use it in the grains of infinity burr seed recipe, which we can then blow up to get infinity reagent. An infinity reagent is very powerful and can be used in high oven mixing to get various high level fluids, which otherwise can be only acquired through very high level machines and using high oven we can get a shortcut for these molten metals. In particular, right now I'm interested in molten electrical steel. Besides phosphor, the burr seed require a couple things. The first one is infinity dust block. Infinity dust block is made of grains of infinity and I was farming grains of infinity couple times back in episode 10 and 12 I believe by se simply setting the bedrock on fire using flint and steel instead of properly automating the process. The reason I didn't really discuss automation was because in my mind the simplest automation is with a fire starter and of course fire starter requires enchanted plates and so in order to make the fire starter I felt obliged to talk about bibliocraft printing press a little bit and for one reason or another I kept postponing it because I wanted to weave it into the story a little better. However, in our travels we have found various things, one of which is this enchanted plate with unbreaking level 3. And when we do get to the printing press, something like this will be very easy to make. So let's sacrifice this and make a proper grains of infinity automation. All of these ingredients for fire starter we have crafted before in the series. The only thing missing is the dusk flame hex, and this stuff can be made inside the packager from magical planks, stone rods and ash. The reason I crafted two of these, first of all, is to show you how this stuff works and it sets these really interesting fires which are called uh, dark fire and you can use the dark fire in order to burn a couple items and they get transformed to a couple other items. I think this is pretty interesting crafting mechanic and so I will keep one stuff for myself and will use it later. This was quite surprising to me, turns out I didn't use the enchanted plate fully, I used one durability out of three and the reason for it of course is that in the bibliography craft when you use the printing plate you can make three duplicates out of it before it expires. So this is where it comes from. Very interesting. I had no idea about that. The fire starter itself is quite easy to automate but to complete the setup I will use yet another item made from the device frame since I keep finding interesting uses for them and that item is called vacuumulator. Vacuumulator is a very interesting block and it works similar to ender hopper or hopper hook from Botania and it will pick up any item within 11 by 11 uh, surface area with the block at the center of it. So as you can see it picks up any items 5 blocks and closer to it but if I throw an item on a block 6 blocks away it doesn't pick it up. The items accumulator picks go into internal 9 stack storage area and they can be outputted to various containers around the block. You can configure the sides and where they output and if you shift right click on the accumulator with an empty hand you will get a chance to set a blacklist or whitelist or do some other filtering for the items it picks. So let's go down to our bedrock area and make a basic setup. In terms of the actual automation there is not much we need to do because if we extinguish the fire as you can see the fire starter just starts it again. The only thing you need to make sure is that it is always on which is the default option I think. Over time this process of course will produce enough grains of infinity for our basic needs. But since I want some right away Let's set the whole bedrock on fire. Now the last thing we need to craft the burst seed is the bursting powder which is pretty straightforward with exception of heavy fuel dust. However, we do still have I believe 8 heavy nuggets and we can use our automated crush and block downstairs to crush these heavy nuggets into the fuel dust. At this point we have enough resources to craft three of these grains of infinity burst seeds and if you ever going to use them I suggest you get into enclosed space because they tend to fly away quite far. We got one and a half stacks of infinity reagent and in order to make molten electrical steel with it we will need lots of silicone but this is pretty easy to make from certus quartz or nether quartz dust in a regular oven. We have both of these types of crystals from the sifting building in essentially infinite quantities so I will simply grab a couple stacks of pure certus quartz here. 
Back at the base we can process the Certus Quartz in so many ways. We can throw them in a macerator, we can throw them in a basic crushing factory, and we can also use our double uh, crusher to process it. Unfortunately the crusher from x Utilities 2 cannot process Certus Quartz, but that's not an issue. While our silicon is cooking, let's grab a couple stacks of blocks of charcoal and run to our high oven. Here we can throw our charcoal into the fuel container and take a look inside the high oven. As you can see the temperature is slowly rising and slow is not what we want so we can speed this up with time in a bottle and now it is much better. The temperature is not exactly over 9000 but still quite high. We have put our reagent and our silicon in and now we can take a look how many blocks of steel we can convert. So I have brought a stack over here. So let's put the 7 in. And as you can see that consumed almost half of the stack of the reagent and uh, almost a stack of silicon. So if we replenish that we can probably do seven more. Molten electrical steel is solidifying into the blocks and I am super happy about it. Because having electrical steel finally allows us to find really good use for our double layer capacitors that we have printed and that is capacitor banks. Why am I so excited about the capacitor bank? Well yes capacitor bank can store a lot of energy and yes if you want you can make a multi-structure out of it. But that's not the main reason I'm so excited about it. Back in episode 14 I needed to calculate how much power my presses will need by adding bunch of specter coils and survivalist generators with known power outputs and looking for the time where I'm switching from positive to negative power consumption rate in order to estimate the actual value. I showed this process of calculation on camera once but in reality I have to do this over and over again for the multitude of setups I make because I want to know exactly how much energy I need for them. And a great specialty of the capacitor bank is if you shift right click with an empty hand on it you get exact amount in a ref per tick and the writing above the number indicates if it's positive or negative. In this case because we're using survival generator it's positive of course. But if we add for example a crusher right next to it and put some cobblestone in, once the processing starts we can see the number settling on negative 15 and that is because the generator generates 5 and the crusher consumes 20 so the deficit is 15 and if we add 3 more of survival generators we will even it out. If you right click on the capacitor bank and hover over the energy bar you can see this number again along with the total amount and current amount of energy stored in the capacitor. And there you have it, we have established a solid way to use 3D printer efficiently and looked into a couple interesting uses of it. And how do you like the capacitor bank shortcut? This is why I'm in love with this pack and keep playing it for several years now. Even if it is a shortcut it still requires elaborate and interesting automation and problem solving. But there is of course another reason I'm so happy to share my playthrough with you. Receiving the comments like this one I got recently is always a highlight of my day. To tell you the truth even if I hope to release these videos more often it looks like I have to settle on somewhat random schedule that my circumstances allow. But it seems that despite haphazard uploads I still get overwhelming support from you all. As you see your magnificent wall keeps growing and I was so glad that several people in the comments have reached out to be added on it. Working on this series is not exactly a chore for me but as you can imagine getting to sit down to work on something as big as my last video which was about 80 hours of work requires a certain amount of motivation. And I wanted to say a huge thank you to the people who keep visiting me on Discord and YouTube and keep giving me that motivation despite not seeing an upload from me for a long while. This is really really helping me. Thank you so very much for watching and I hope to see you all next time. Same place.